Open your Bibles this morning to the New Testament book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're beginning a new series of sermons this morning that will take us up to and through Easter Sunday. And I'm calling this series of sermons, The Hope of the Gospel. Today's message also has that same title, The Hope of the Gospel. Colossians chapter 1. Go ahead and find your way there and we'll read in just a moment. Some of you know this about me, perhaps others of you, perhaps many of you don't, but I love the theater. I love musicals. I actually had the lead parts in No, No, Nanette, and I remember Mama back in college, a couple of old plays, and, uh, but I, I, I love the theater. In fact, it's, it's one of the reasons I love New York City. I rarely go to New York that I don't watch a play. I was in Toronto a few years back and had a free evening, and so I went to see a musical I had never seen on stage, Les Miserables. New York has Broadway, Toronto has the Entertainment District. But I went to see the classic, iconic Les Miserables, and on the walk back to the hotel, I called Beth and told her that I thought Les Mis was the best musical I had ever seen in my life. Now, she pushed back a bit on that, but we went to see it together at TPAC January a year ago. I'm not sure that she would say it's the best thing she's ever seen, but she loved it too, and I knew that she would. But there's a key character in Les Mis named Fontaine. An orphan, but full of dreams, Fontaine got pregnant out of wedlock. That's part of the backstory for the musical. But the guy deserted her, and so she was left to raise her daughter, Cosette, on her own in a world that was not friendly to such situations. I'm leapfrogging over lots of details, but she was eventually forced into the streets where she sold her hair, her body, even her teeth to pay for Cosette's care. She was sick when she sings, in the musical version of the story, when she sings, I dreamed a dream in time gone by, when hope was high and life worth living. It's an incredible song, very emotional. But the last line of that song sums up the dark place Fontaine was when she sang it. These are the last words of the song. Now... Life has killed the dream I dreamed. Life has killed the dream I dreamed. That was her bottom line. I pray none of us are as desperate as Fontaine, but I would expect we can all identify with dreams we dreamed that never came true and hopes that were never realized. If we've not been there ourselves, we certainly know someone who has. And in those times... Hope can be hard to come by. I know some of you have lived through more desperate times of history than I, but I don't remember a time in my life when, generally speaking, hope was in such short supply in our world as it is right now. Across and among all age groups, And before we blame one politician or political party over another, politics and politicians have always been problems more than solutions on both sides of the aisle. And if we want to argue that wars or drugs or violence or immorality are killing hope in the world today, none of those are new. If I had to put my finger on the problem, the real problem, I'd say people are looking for hope in all the wrong places, hoping in all the wrong things. Listen, anytime you go looking for sunshine in the dead of night or panning for gold in a dry creek bed, you're going to end up disappointed. And so we need to discover, or in some cases rediscover, hope, hope that is true, hope that is lasting. Let's read Colossians chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 21. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, 
Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. The Apostle Paul mentioned the hope of the gospel to encourage believers in Colossae to keep on keeping on in the faith. There were false teachers in the church of Colossae. We don't know who they were per se. Paul never says. But unlike some false teachers of the first century, these false teachers weren't trying to erase Jesus from the faith. Just diminish his significance. They would have gladly said that Jesus is prominent, just not preeminent. They would have advocated for Jesus to be chief among equals. But Jesus has no equals. This was their false teaching, to diminish the significance, the majesty, the glory of Jesus. And so Paul was urging believers to not move away from the hope of the gospel, to stay true to the hope of the gospel. That word hope means expectation. And even more specifically, expectation of what is sure or certain. Much like the confident expectation, the hope we have of receiving a paycheck for work well done. An honest day's wage for an honest day's work. Or the hope we have, the expectation when we plant seeds in a garden. That if we plant watermelon seeds, we're not going to get green beans. Or when we're in a big city and waiting for a bus or a a, a, a subway train, we wait with hopeful expectation that it'll arrive according to schedule and that it will take us to its scheduled destination. Hope is expectation. That's why Paul could say in Romans 5, 5, hope does not disappoint. It's an expectation of what is sure or certain. And so let's talk for a few moments about the hope of the gospel. Why is it so important that we don't drift away from the hope of the gospel or let anything cause us to give up on it? For starters, we need to understand that the hope of the gospel is not a something, but a someone. The hope of the gospel in a nutshell is Jesus. Paul's going to say a few verses later in this chapter, down in verse 27, that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And in the same way, Jesus is the hope of the gospel. The word gospel means good news, as you know, and it's used in at least three ways in the New Testament. Explicitly, it's the death and resurrection of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Ultimately, It's a call to repent, obey, and worship God, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. But generally, Jesus is the good news. We have four books in the New Testament called Gospels. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, for instance, says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Son of God. The gospel is everything Jesus So once again, the hope of the gospel is Jesus. But hope by default is future focused. Because as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 verse 24, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? That hope in a future reality, however, is based in a past reality. Specifically, when Jesus bridged the divide between sinful humanity and holy God, as, 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 as Paul says back in verse 20, through the blood of his cross. Actually, there are past, present, and future dimensions to the hope we have in Jesus. And these are the doors I want us to knock on this morning. The past, the present, and the future. Hope is in short supply these days only because people are dropping their buckets into dry wells. The hope of the gospel, though, is a well that never runs dry, a well of water springing up to eternal life as Jesus described it in John chapter 4. 
Look back to verse 21. And here we look to the past. In the past, we were far away from God and could not reach him. In the past, we were far away from God and could not reach him. Every person ever saved by the grace of God can give this same testimony. In the past, we were far away from God and could not reach him. The scripture says, you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. To be alienated from God, a stranger to God, is to be separated and far from God. And Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 tells us how we got there. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And listen, no one can say, I'm not a sinner. When Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul isn't just saying that we did our best, but our best wasn't good enough. That we aimed at the target, but our arrows fell short. In reality, we fall short of the glory of God. We miss the mark. That's what the word sin literally means, to miss the mark. When we aim at the wrong target altogether, no one can say, I'm not a sinner. The Bible bears testimony to this fact over and over again. Solomon, in his prayer over the newly built temple, prayed, there is no man who does not sin. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, 2 Chronicles 6, 36, there is no man who does not sin. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul quoted Psalm 14, verse 3, to say there is none righteous, no, not one, not even one. John wrote in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. No one can say, I'm not a sinner. But it's not just that our sins have made us far from God. Our sins have made us enemies of God. We were enemies of God in our thoughts, hostile in mind, and in our actions, engaged in evil deeds. Romans chapter 8 verse 7 says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. There's that idea of being enemies of God in our thoughts, hostile in mind. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. And there's that idea of being enemies of God in our actions, engaged in evil deeds. So the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. I said earlier that in the past we were far away from God and could not reach him. For it is not even able to do so. By the way, when Paul wrote this same idea to the Ephesian believers, Ephesians and Colossians are considered sister letters in the New Testament. They were both written around the same time period. They both have, the, have similarities in style, content, themes. They're sister letters. They're remarkably similar. But when Paul wrote the same idea to the Ephesian believers in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, he said, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. <laughs> having no hope. In the past, we were far away from God, could not reach him. Having no hope hope. But look again at verse 22, Colossians 1.22. In the present, all that is changed. Even though we were far from God in the past, in the present, our relationship with God is changed. God doesn't change. He's perfect and holy and always the same. No, no. He changes us. And that's what changes our relationship with God. And here's how that happens. He has reconciled you. He has now restored our broken relationship with God, broken by our sin. We who were enemies of God in the past are now his friends. But not because of what we have done. Remember, in the past, we were far away from God and could not reach him. 
So the reconciliation is something God did, not us. But how? How did God reconcile us to himself? How did God turn enemies into friends? He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. Our sins separated us from God. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Sin has a penalty that must be paid. The wages of sin is death. And so the only payment, the only penalty sufficient for sin is death. But when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, because of our sins, when Jesus took our place and died our death, our sin debt was paid in full. And the opposition God had toward us as sinners was removed. And here's what that means. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless. And beyond reproach, reconciliation with God means that from that point forward and forever, we're seen as perfect and pure in God's eyes to the extent that we are, once again, from that point forward and forever, we are beyond reproach, flawless, never to be accused ever again. You say, how can that possibly be? It is because the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. It's possible because God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. In the past, we had no hope. But in the present, our hope. Our expectation of what is sure or certain is Jesus. Jesus who tore down the wall of sin that separated us from God. Jesus who bridged the divide between holy God and sinful humanity. Jesus who assumed the guilt and paid the penalty for our sins so that we could be declared not guilty and set free. Jesus. So in the past, we were far away from God and could not reach him. In the present, our relationship with God is changed. We were his enemies, but now God has made us his friends. And finally, in the future, the evidence of a changed relationship is a changed life. The evidence of a changed relationship is a changed life. Look at verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now, Paul is not suggesting by using the word if that we might not continue in the faith or that we might move away from the hope of the gospel. What what, what he's saying is that continuing in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moving away from the hope of the gospel is actually evidence that we've been reconciled to God. The evidence of a changed relationship with God is a life changed by God. And the hope of the gospel, our expectation Our our, our trust, our expectant trust in what Jesus did for us on the cross and the promises he made, these empower that changed life. Some of us, though, know how imperfect we still are. (laughs) I still think I'm the worst sinner there is. And that causes a spiritual heartburn, and for good reason it should. But that's just it, the hope of the gospel It's not that we'll never sin again this side of heaven. But that even when we do, we're seen as faultless before the Father because we're covered in the righteousness of Christ. Imagine what would happen if the doctrine of reconciliation became explosively real in our lives. Imagine if we truly took this idea of being reconciled to God, to heart? What if we let the fact that when we're in Christ and Christ is in us, we're perfect and pure in God's eyes? 
What if we let that knowledge order our steps? Do you think it would give us permission to live in sin or power to rise above it? I assure you that it is the latter. The evidence of a changed relationship is a changed life. And hope is at the center of both. But if hope is misplaced, if we hope in anything, anyone other than Jesus, if hope is misplaced, everything else that follows will be too. It's like starting to button up a shirt but getting the first button in the wrong hole. We've all been there. No matter how carefully we might button the other buttons, they'll all be off too. And I'm convinced that's why people's lives are filled with such chaos and confusion, such guilt and shame, such helplessness and hopelessness because they're looking for hope in all the wrong places, hoping in all the wrong things. I love that old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus this morning. Turn your eyes upon the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is Jesus. Turn your eyes upon him. If you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, turned away from self and sin to trust in Jesus, his righteousness, demonstrated upon the cross, validated with an empty tomb, Jesus. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ, would you today be saved? Would you give your heart to Christ? We'd love today to help you take that step of faith with him. Pastors are going to be standing to my right, to your left, under the Where Lives Connect wall. At least one will be there. And we'd love today to help you take your next step with Jesus. Now, I realize that, that perhaps many of you, maybe even most of you, have already done that. But I would ask you today, how are you doing with this past, present, and future reality of the hope of the gospel? How are you doing with this doctrine of reconciliation? What that means to your life, you're standing before God. How are you doing with that? I'll tell you what gives me heartburn in, in our day. Are those who have moved away from the hope of the gospel to put their trust in lesser things. Believing that those lesser things are somehow going to fix what's broken in the world. But I assure you, they, they, they won't because they can't. And so for some of us, today needs to be a day when we draw a line in the sand and a fresh and a new, we commit ourselves to the hope of the gospel. I'm asking you to do that today. I'm going to pray when I say amen. We'll sing another song. And during that song, I'm asking you to move. Pastors will be waiting on you. You can respond electronically. That information is on the screen. But you can talk to somebody in person right now, those of you who are in the house. But I'm going to pray when I say amen. We'll stand, we'll sing, and I'm going to ask you to come. Gracious Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I thank you here and now for the hope of the gospel. Lord, may we continue to be true to it. Lord, you have saved us through the gospel. Lord, you have confirmed your salvation to us through the gospel. And Lord, I pray that we would become witnesses to that hope that only you can bring into our lives and only you can share through our lives. But Father, bless this moment, this time of obedience that we call an invitation. Lord, bless it as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You come as God's Holy Spirit speaks. You come.